Hello, I'm Joseph Benti, your host for the First Aid Videotape. This just may be the most important videotape you'll ever watch. Because this show has been designed to help you save a life. We had two goals in mind when we prepared this tape. The first to give you practical advice for appropriate aid and assistance in cases of sudden and unexpected illness or injury. And the second to provide educational information about prevention of illness and injury and how to properly obtain emergency assistance when it is needed. There's also another important reason why we've made this program. We want you to know that you can make the difference between life and death. Case in point, on January 30th, 1985, the Sacramento Fire Department received a 911 emergency phone call from Tammy Andrioli, a young mother who had just found her small child floating unconscious in their swimming pool. When Mrs. Andrioli first found her son, she panicked. She didn't know what to do. When the fire department dispatcher asked her if she could do CPR on her son, she had to say no. Fortunately, the fire dispatcher who answered the call was specially trained to talk her through the emergency. He was able to calm her down and instruct her over the phone. As a result, her son, Andrew, was saved, and he's going to grow up to live a normal life. But is luck really enough when we're talking about human life? If you were to be faced with a life or death emergency, would you be able to handle it? Wouldn't you rather feel the confidence of knowing the right thing to do instead of the panic of not knowing what to do? Well, that's what this program is all about, building your confidence. You see, you don't have to be an expert to handle an emergency. This first aid videotape will give you all the basic information you'll need to do the right thing when faced with an emergency. We want this videotape to be your confidence builder, and we've designed it to do just that. This program and its accompanying quick reference cards are to be used together as a system to prepare you for many types of emergencies and to give you the kind of first aid information that you'll need to be confident and helpful. To get the most out of this program, make sure you won't be interrupted while watching the tape. It's over an hour long, so you'll need to set aside some time without phone calls or any other distractions. We also suggest you watch it from start to finish the first time. Once you've watched the entire tape, inspect the exclusive reference card system that's also included. There's a quick reference card for each of the subjects covered in the tape. You can use these cards to help you quickly review the topics discussed in this program. Now you'll notice that each card is marked with a chapter title and a number. The same chapter title and number also appears at the beginning of each segment in the videotape. If you want to review in more detail about how to provide first aid for a burn, for example, all you have to do is locate the chapter number on the quick reference card for burns, and then fast forward your VCR until that chapter title and number appears on your screen. That's all there is to it. We do not recommend that you wait for an emergency to happen and then go searching for information on how to provide first aid. By studying the first aid tape and the handy reference card system before an emergency occurs, you can be well prepared to act properly and confidently, especially if you refresh your knowledge from time to time by reviewing the videotape and reference cards. Well, enough said. Let's get started. The most deadly medical emergency in North America is caused by heart disease. Although much progress has been made over the years, Heart disease is still the number one killer in our society. And quite frankly, one of the reasons heart disease is so deadly is because people don't recognize the signs and symptoms of a heart attack. Or if they do suspect that they may be having a heart attack, they deny the symptoms and don't take the appropriate action soon enough. Most deaths caused by heart attacks occur before the victim arrives at a hospital. Medical studies have shown that heart attack deaths can be prevented if the proper action is taken within two minutes after the signals of a heart attack begin. It is essential that you recognize these signals and know what action to take when they occur. Now, what are these signals? Most commonly, an uncomfortable pressure, squeezing fullness or pain that's usually located in the center of the chest, behind the breastbone. This pain may spread to shoulder, neck, and arms. It might last two minutes or longer. It may come and go. 
It's not always severe, and it's often associated with sweating, nausea, shortness of breath, and a feeling of weakness. Sharp, stabbing pains are not usually signals of a heart attack. Heart attacks can occur in both males or females of any age group starting as young as 18 years of age. And they don't necessarily happen only during physical or emotional stress. Remember, you can greatly reduce the risk of heart attack death if you act within two minutes after the victim begins to have the signs and symptoms. To act properly, it may be important to know whether the victim has a history of heart disease or whether this is a first event for the victim. If the victim has no known history of heart disease, in other words, this is the first time they have experienced the signs and symptoms of a heart attack, you need to help him or her recognize those signs and signals. Very commonly, people who suffer a heart attack deny that the pain and discomfort they are experiencing is actually a heart attack. Often people presume that it's only indigestion, and that can be a deadly matter. Even if the victim denies that he or she may be having a heart attack, you should convince them to stop all activities and to sit or to lie down, whichever is more comfortable for them. If the symptoms continue for two minutes or more, call your local EMS, Emergency Medical Service, without delay. In most areas, you can call 911 to be in immediate contact with an emergency medical dispatcher. As soon as you mention that the victim is suffering chest pain, that dispatcher may ask you several very important questions. At that moment, it may seem to you that time's being wasted with these questions, but they are important. They help the dispatcher select the most appropriate response. As you're dialing 911, or the appropriate emergency number for your area, take two or three deep breaths and then exhale completely. Force yourself to calm down, lower your voice, and prepare to talk at a normal rate. Getting hysterical and talking fast to an emergency dispatcher actually slows down the response and increases the possibility of an error. As calmly as you can, be prepared to answer the following essential questions. What is the phone number you are calling from? What is the victim's age? Is the victim male or female? Is the victim conscious? Is the victim breathing? In addition, the following information may be requested by the emergency dispatcher. Is the victim suffering any pain? If so, can you describe the location of the pain, whether it's sharp or dull, whether it's spreading to shoulder, neck, or arms, and how long the victim has been feeling the pain? Are there any changes in the victim's normal skin color? Is the victim sweaty or feeling nauseated? Have you checked the victim's heartbeat, pulse? If so, could you tell whether it was regular or irregular? Has the victim recently suffered from fever or a cough? Does the victim have a history of heart disease or heart attacks? A well-trained dispatcher can ask all of those questions and get the desired information in less than one minute. If you're prepared and calm, that minute is well spent if it helps the dispatcher to determine the urgency of the case and helps to select the most appropriate response. For example, not every ambulance is staffed by paramedics. So the information you provide may dictate that a paramedic ambulance be diverted from a less serious call and dispatched to your emergency. If you inform the dispatcher that the victim has a history of heart disease, the dispatcher may ask whether he or she is taking any medications and whether those medications have been taken recently. One of the most important medications for heart disease patients are these little pills. They're nitroglycerin tablets. Probably the victim will have taken up to three of these in the first several minutes after the symptoms began. If the nitroglycerin tablets do not ease the pain within 10 minutes, call 911 without delay. When you call 911 or the appropriate emergency number for your area, after you've answered the dispatcher's key questions, you may be asked to remain on the phone while emergency units are responding to your location. Even if the dispatcher hangs up, you should keep that phone line clear till the emergency units arrive. The dispatcher may need to call you back and clarify information, ask for an update on the patient's conditions, or advise you on how to perform certain emergency procedures. In many cases, the heart attack will worsen before the emergency units arrive, and the victim will suffer a condition known as cardiac arrest. In cardiac arrest, the victim is unresponsive, is not breathing, has no pulse. When this happens, 
The victim's survival depends on quick and appropriate action. You must be able to perform the life-saving steps of cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR. The first step in performing CPR is to shake the victim by the shoulders and to shout, are you okay? This is to see whether they are actually unconscious and unresponsive. Next, the dispatcher will tell you to position the victim on their back on the floor. CPR cannot be performed effectively on a soft surface. After doing this, open the victim's airway by tilting the head and lifting the chin. The next step will be to check for breathing. Look, listen, and feel. Once you've determined that the victim is not breathing, force two full breaths into the lungs. Then check for a pulse as shown here. Feeling the carotid arteries on either side of the neck. If you are unable to find a pulse, begin chest compressions. You will do that by locating the sternum, or breastbone, in the center of the chest between the nipples. Then, place the heel of one hand on top of the other and push down firmly into the chest, two inches. You need to alternate these compressions with breaths. 15 compressions and two breaths. Another 15 compressions and two breaths, continuously until official rescuers arrive. Surely the worst of all nightmares is to find an infant or a child unconscious and apparently not breathing. It's essential that we all know what to do in such a situation. Just as it does when the victim is an adult, survival depends on quick and appropriate action by a person trained in first aid. It may be necessary for you to do CPR on an infant or a child. Now CPR techniques for infants and children are different than those for adults, and they are slightly different between infants under one year of age and children between the ages of one and eight. Generally, when the victim is an older child, eight years or older, CPR is to be performed as though the victim were an adult. If you find an infant or a child who is not breathing, you must act immediately. First, gently shake the infant or child and shout loud enough to awaken it. If the victim does not respond, Call out for help and make sure that someone calls 911 or the appropriate emergency number for your area. Position the infant or child on its back. Tilt the head back, lift the chin. With infants, you should tilt the head back gently, not as far as an adult's. And then put your ear down close to the mouth and look at the chest. Look, listen, feel for breathing. If there is no breathing, give two slow breaths, keep the head tipped, Open your mouth wide and put it over the mouth and nose of the infant or child. If a child is too large for you to make a good seal over the mouth and nose, pinch the victim's nose and make a seal over the mouth as you would with an adult victim. In giving the first two slow breaths, remember that infants and children have smaller lungs. They require less air per breath. Take your mouth away from the infant or child between each breath. This will allow you to inhale fresh air for the next breath. After you give the two slow breaths, check for a pulse. For an infant, you should place the tips of two fingers on the inside of their arm, halfway between the infant's elbow and shoulder. To feel for the pulse, place your thumb on the opposite side of the arm and squeeze very gently. If the victim is a child, more than one year old, you can check for a pulse at the neck, just as you would for an adult. You should check for five to 10 seconds. If you find that the infant or child is not breathing and has no pulse, Begin CPR by pushing on the middle of the sternum, breastbone, with two or three fingers, one finger's width below an imaginary line between the nipples. Do not push on the lower end of the sternum. It can bend and damage internal organs. You will need to compress the infant's chest about at a rate of 100 times each minute. That's about twice per second. Be sure that the infant's head is at the same level as the heart, or slightly lower. If the infant is not on a firm surface, you can support the infant's head and back in your hand and along your arm. Give one breath after each five compressions. Repeat this procedure continuously until official rescuers arrive. If the victim is a child and is too large for finger pressure to work, use the heel of one hand and compress at a rate of about 80 per minute. Compress the child's chest only about an inch and a half with each compression. Again. Give one breath for every five compressions.
Choking is another very deadly medical emergency. Each year, more than 3,000 Americans choke to death, and it's the leading cause of death in the home for children under the age of one. In a choking emergency, there is no time to wait for official rescuers or medical assistance. A person choking on food or a foreign object will die or suffer permanent brain damage within several minutes. Whoever is present when the crisis occurs must perform the rescue. Most often, choking occurs when food, a toy, or some small object in the mouth slips back into the throat area and blocks the victim's airway. Because the airway is blocked, the victim will not be able to speak or to breathe. If they are still conscious, immediately ask, are you choking? The victim usually will be able to nod, yes. Many persons already have been trained to use a universal signal when they are choking. The victim gives the sign by bringing one or both hands to the throat and using the thumbs and index fingers spread widely to form a V. If you find someone unconscious and not breathing, how do you know whether they have choked or whether they have suffered a heart attack and cardiac arrest? Well, look around and think. If a victim is found in a hallway, a restroom, or an area near a restaurant or eating place, and there is no indication of physical injury, you should assume that the person has choked on food. In either case, when you see someone choking or find someone who has choked and become unconscious, you must help them immediately. If someone else is available, have them call your local emergency medical services and report a person not breathing. While this is happening, you must perform a procedure known as the Heimlich Maneuver. This procedure is very simple, and it's been performed successfully thousands of times by people just like you and me. There are three ways to perform the Heimlich Maneuver on another person, depending on whether the victim is standing, seated, or lying down. In addition, it can be used by choking victims on themselves. Now, let's discuss each of these ways to perform the Heimlich Maneuver. When the choking victim is standing, you must stand behind the victim and wrap your arms around the victim's waist. Make a fist with one of your hands and place the thumb side of your fist against the victim's abdomen, slightly above the navel and below the ribcage. And then grab your fist with the other hand and press into the victim's abdomen with a quick upward thrust. The thrust is repeated several times if necessary. When the choking victim is seated, you use the same procedure as when the victim is standing. That is, you get behind the victim, wrap your arms around the victim's waist. Make a fist with one of your hands, Place the thumb side of your fist against the victim's abdomen, slightly above the navel, below the ribcage, and grab that fist with your other hand and press into the victim's abdomen with a quick upward thrust. The thrust is repeated several times if necessary. Now, if the victim is seated in a straight back chair, the back of the chair can act as a support and may actually make the rescue effort more effective. If the victim is sitting in a dining booth, an airplane seat or a chair too large for you to reach around, the rescue can still be performed while the victim remains seated. Simply turn the victim sideways so that you can get behind him and perform the maneuver. If the choking victim is lying on the ground or the floor, first turn them face up. You should then face the victim and kneel astride the victim's hips. Then place one of your hands on top of the other with the heel of your bottom hand on the victim's abdomen, slightly above the navel, below the ribcage, and then press into the abdomen with a quick upward thrust. The thrust is repeated several times if necessary. Now, what if you're all alone and your airway becomes blocked by food or some foreign object? You cannot breathe, therefore you can't even speak. Even if you're close to a telephone, you can't tell anyone what's wrong or where you are. Besides, you'll be unconscious in about 30 seconds. What should you do? There are two possible methods for performing the Heimlich Maneuver on yourself. In the first method, you position your own hand slightly above your navel and below your ribcage, and then you press your fist into your abdomen with a quick upward thrust, repeating it several times if necessary. In the other method, you position yourself over the edge of a fixed horizontal object, such as a chair back, a railing, or a table edge, and then press your abdomen into the edge with a quick movement, repeating the movement if necessary. Now, few things could be more frightening than a child choking. The Heimlich Maneuver can be performed on children and infants. However, it is most important that you remain calm if the child or infant chokes in your presence. Only you can make the difference between life and death if you remain calm. Remember, a child or an infant choking on food or a foreign object cannot breathe or cry out. An unconscious child or infant who is not breathing and lacks signs of physical injury or obvious ailments probably is a victim of choking. 
As with all applications of the Heimlich maneuver, you press into the abdomen with a quick upward thrust. Several thrusts may be necessary to expel the object. Probably the greatest advantage of the Heimlich maneuver is its simplicity. That's why thousands of people have been able to save a human life with it. But the joy of saving a life will be even greater if no damage is done in the process. The most important thing to remember is to control your emotions and to use proper hand position. Obviously, a person who is out of control can do no good for a choking victim, whether young or old. You must remain calm. Equally important is the placement of your hands. Whether the victim is young or old, or in between, your hand should be placed between the navel and the bottom of the victim's rib cage. If performed properly, the Heimlich maneuver forces the rapid expulsion of the remaining air in the victim's lungs through their trachea and larynx, and thus expelling the obstructing object. This life-saving technique saves thousands of lives every year. If you have an opportunity to use the Heimlich maneuver, the victim should be seen by a physician even though the blockage is cleared and the victim is able to breathe again. Serious complications can occur, even though they may not be obvious right away. You should insist that the victim proceed immediately to a family physician or an emergency medical facility for an examination. Let me ask you a question. If you were the first person on the scene of a serious automobile accident, would you know what to do? If you weren't properly trained in first aid, you'd probably feel terribly inadequate in a situation like that. Automobile and motorcycle accidents, as well as accidental falls and violent assaults, often cause physical injuries also known as trauma. Trauma is the most common cause of death in the United States among people under the age of 40. For those who survive trauma, these often leave them paralyzed or disabled. To help more people survive trauma and to help prevent injuries from causing paralysis or disability, trauma centers have been set up throughout the country. Trauma centers are hospitals that have specially trained personnel and equipment to provide very prompt surgical and medical care for patients who are critically injured. The goal of most emergency medical service, or EMS systems, is to get the trauma victim from the place of injury into the trauma center's operating room within the so-called golden hour, a 60-minute period during which the victim may begin to suffer from deadly shock. It's important to understand that some trauma victims will die unless they receive highly specialized care within that golden hour. Sometimes EMS personnel will transport a trauma victim past one or more hospitals to take the victim to a trauma center. This is appropriate, although it may be misunderstood by those who feel the victim should be taken to the closest hospital. When you're the first person to find a trauma victim, what should you do? Well, if there's any possibility that the victim has spinal injuries or if the victim has lost consciousness, has severe bleeding or possible internal bleeding, you must activate the EMS system immediately by having someone call 911 or the appropriate emergency number for your area. First aid for trauma victims is limited, but it's extremely important. For example, many trauma victims with major head injuries also have neck injuries. The brain controls virtually all body functions, and it sends directions to various parts of the body through a very delicate part of the body called the spinal cord. The spinal cord runs through a small channel in the bony spinal column, all the way from the skull to the tailbone. The individual pieces of the spine, which are called vertebrae, are made of bone, and they are brittle. They can be broken whenever the victim suffers trauma, such as an auto accident or a fall. When the broken pieces of vertebrae come in contact with the delicate spinal cord, the spinal cord can be injured or even cut in two. This will cause permanent paralysis. Now you can play an important role in preventing this devastating injury. The first thing you can do is to make certain that you and your family buckle up every time you go anywhere in a car. In many places, it's the law. Everywhere, it's the best way we know of to prevent devastating spinal cord injuries. Now if you were to arrive at the scene of an auto accident and you found the driver unconscious at the wheel, your first job is to make sure that someone reliable has called for train rescuers, usually the fire or police department. After that, the most important thing you can do is to protect the trauma victim while waiting for them to arrive. How do you do that? Your first priority is to keep the victim's head in a neutral position. Place your hands on either side of the victim's head. Make sure that your hands are properly placed. You will be holding this victim's head until you are relieved by trained rescuers. Once your hands are in place, 
Hold the head straight forward with the neck in a neutral position. This neutral position of the head and neck will reduce the possibility of spinal cord injury. Unless you observe heavy smoke or flames or spilled gasoline around a wrecked car, it is best not to move injured victims until trained rescuers arrive. If the victim's spinal column has been cracked or broken, unnecessary movement could damage the spinal cord and result in paralysis or even death. Now be sure someone has called 911 for help. They should be prepared to give the exact location to the emergency dispatcher. While you are performing first aid, enlist another spectator to protect the vehicles and the accident victims from oncoming traffic. If warning flares are placed in the roadway, make certain that they are not placed downstream from spilled fuel. Gasoline fumes are heavier than air. They're invisible and they flow downhill. If gasoline fumes come in contact with a flame or a flare, they'll ignite and the flames will travel right back to the source of the spilled fuel. Again, the most important thing you can do in this situation is to keep the victim's head in a neutral position until you are relieved by official rescuers. Throughout this procedure, you must not release your hold on the victim's head. You must not allow the victim to turn his head up or down or sideways. Unfortunately, some injuries, especially head injuries, tend to cause the victim to become nauseous, sick to their stomach. If you're protecting the victim's neck when this happens, you must make certain that the vomit does not collect in the mouth and block the victim's airway. Aside from blocking the airway, which makes it impossible for the victim to breathe, if vomitous material gets into the airway and into the lungs, it can cause fatal damage and infection. If the victim does vomit, or if blood is collecting in the mouth, you must get help and roll the victim onto his side, allowing the material to flow out of the mouth and away from the victim's airway. To protect the victim against a crippling injury to the spinal cord, the victim must be rolled like a log so that the spine does not turn or twist in the process. If the victim is bleeding severely, you or another spectator should try to control it by applying direct continuous pressure to the source of the bleeding. If you're already immobilizing the victim's neck, that is if you suspect a possible neck injury, you should get someone else to apply the pressure to the source of the severe bleeding. Now what if you're all alone and the victim has a possible neck injury and also severe bleeding? If the bleeding is active either from an artery or a vein, this is a certain life-threatening injury, while the neck injury is only suspected. To save the victim from potentially deadly shock, you may need to turn your attention to the bleeding problem until you can get more help. Trauma is never easy to look at. It's bloody, it's painful, and it's frightening. What the trauma victim needs most from you is to be protected from further harm until official rescuers arrive. If there's no one else at the scene who has medical or rescue training, you should take command and provide first aid until official rescuers arrive. First, make sure someone has called for help. If you send someone to make the call, instruct them to come back and let you know it was done. If the situation involves a traffic collision, ask someone to protect the vehicles and the victims from oncoming traffic. Don't place flares in or around gasoline. Unless you observe heavy smoke or flames or spilled gasoline under or on the vehicles, it is best not to move the victims until official rescuers arrive. Meanwhile, your most important three jobs are to hold the victim's head in a neutral position to prevent injury to the spinal column, protect the victim's airway against blood or vomitous material, and to control severe bleeding. Even where the victim is critically injured, if proper first aid is provided at the scene, and if the official rescuers can get the victim to a specially designated trauma center within that golden hour from the moment of injury, there is a good chance the victim will survive. In many cases of trauma, one or more bones will be broken. But most often, broken bones, known as fractures, occur without other trauma. In and of themselves, fractures generally are not life-threatening. All fractures require medical attention, however. Fractures are either closed or open. In a closed fracture, the skin over the fracture has not been broken. In an open fracture, there is an open wound near where the bone is broken. Most often, this opening is caused by sharp bone ends penetrating the skin. Fractures with severe bleeding, or which involve the spine, or which are caused by major trauma, must be considered serious emergencies and require immediate emergency transportation to a hospital. Less serious fractures usually do not require emergency transportation, but they should be examined and treated by a physician within an hour of the injury. 
The signs and symptoms of fractures are as follows. Deformity, pain and tenderness, swelling or discoloration, exposed bone ends. If you believe the victim has suffered a serious fracture, do these things. Call 911 or the appropriate emergency number in your area for emergency medical services. Do not move the victim unless the victim is in immediate danger. Do not straighten or handle the fracture. Keep the victim comfortable, preserve body heat, and wait for the arrival of EMS personnel. The sight of blood is frightening to most people and may even make you feel faint. The fact is that most cases of bleeding are not life-threatening. However, severe bleeding can lead to shock, which is a life-threatening condition, and it must be treated promptly. If the victim is conscious, alert, has normal skin temperature or skin color, and the act of bleeding has stopped, then the situation probably is not an emergency. If bleeding has not stopped, apply firm, continuous, direct pressure using a sterile cloth or gauze pad directly on the wound. If no cloth or pads are available, apply direct pressure using your hand until help arrives. If the injury is to a limb, an arm or a leg, elevate the limb while maintaining direct pressure. If after using direct pressure for five minutes or more, active bleeding continues, either spurting bright red blood from an artery or oozing darker red blood from a vein, call 911 or the appropriate emergency number for your area and report the emergency. Continue applying pressure until arrival of official rescuers. If at any time the bleeding victim shows signs of shock, such as weak pulse, cool, pale skin, or confused behavior, call 911 and report the emergency. Meanwhile, while waiting for official rescuers, remember to protect the victim's airway. If the victim loses pulse and respiration, it will be necessary for you to start CPR. Severe bleeding can actually be internal, meaning that it occurs inside the body, and you may not be able to see the blood. Internal bleeding may occur as a result of a fall or other injury or accident or a stomach ulcer. A victim of internal bleeding very quickly can suffer from shock, and shock should always be treated as a life-threatening emergency. Vomiting blood or passing blood in the urine or stool usually indicates some form of internal bleeding. Vomit that looks like coffee grounds or black tarry stools or both are signs of internal bleeding and should be treated as a life-threatening emergency. This victim can only be treated in a hospital. Call for emergency medical services immediately. Shock can occur when the heart does not pump enough blood. This might happen as a result of severe heart disease, for example. Shock can also result from severe bleeding, when the amount of blood in the body is seriously reduced. It may also occur when blood vessels become enlarged, or when there is not enough oxygen in the blood due to respiratory problems. The signs and symptoms of shock are present when the victim is extremely anxious and restless, has a rapid, weak pulse, is perspiring heavily but has cold, clammy skin, has a pale or bluish skin color, complains of thirst, has shallow or irregular breathing, feels nauseated or has been vomiting, has eyes which appear dull with enlarged pupils, or is unconscious. First aid for a shock victim is fairly limited, but it's straightforward and very important. After making sure that someone has called for official rescuers, you should make certain that the shock victim's airway is open and protected. Do not place a pillow under the head of a victim of a serious emergency. The pillow thrusts the head forward. If the person loses consciousness, the tongue can fall backward into the throat. If you use a pillow at all, it should be placed beneath the victim's shoulder blades, causing the victim's head to fall back. That's important to maintaining an open airway. If a shock victim stops breathing or does not have a pulse, it will be necessary for you to start CPR. Control any bleeding that may be apparent by using direct continuous pressure on the site of any active severe bleeding. In first aid for shock victims, the position of the victim is very important. In most cases, you should raise the victim's feet and legs if the feet and legs are uninjured. This takes advantage of gravity, and blood flows from the legs to the brain and internal organs, where it is most needed. If a neck or spine injury is suspected, you will need to protect the spinal cord by holding the victim's head in a neutral position. 
in all cases, you'll need to protect the victim's airway. Fires and hot liquids are the causes of more than 90% of all burns suffered by humans in the United States. Eight of every 10 burn injuries occur in the home. Two million people are burned each year, and one in 10 will require hospitalization. One of the most important public education messages is presented to elementary school children by local fire departments. That program teaches the children to stop, drop, and roll if their clothing catches fire. Whether it's an adult or a child, you cannot run away from burning clothing. You must stop. You must drop to the floor or the ground, and you must roll quickly on the floor or ground to put the fire out. If water is available immediately, and the clothing continues to burn or smolder after the victim has rolled on the floor or ground, then you should douse the fire or smoldering clothing with the water. As quickly as possible, remove burning or smoldering clothing that is not stuck to the skin. If some portions of the clothing are stuck to the skin, do not attempt to pull those portions of clothing free. Removal has to be performed by medical personnel at a hospital. Now, if the fire has caused the air to be smoky, making it difficult to breathe, remove the victim from the smoky area if that's possible. If the victim is unconscious or unable to walk, and if the victim is too large for you to carry, roll the victim onto a blanket and then pull the blanket across the floor if you can. As soon as possible, check the victim's pulse and breathing. If the victim has no pulse or respirations, call for help and start CPR. If the victim has a pulse and is breathing, check to see whether the burned skin feels hot. If the burned skin feels hot, and if the burn involves less than 20% of the adult victim's total skin surface, or less than 5% of the child victim's total skin surface, consider cooling the burned skin with water. Check the victim's mouth or nose for singed hair in the nose or around the mouth, or for red or blistered skin, or for soot. This would indicate whether the victim has inhaled flames or hot gases. If so, swelling may occur in the victim's nose, mouth, or throat, and breathing may become difficult before official rescuers arrive. It will be necessary for you to help maintain an open airway. If the victim has been burned by chemicals, not a fire, immediately decontaminate the skin by flushing it with large amounts of water. Do not use ointments, grease, margarine, butter, or similar substances on burned skin. Never apply ice directly to burned skin. Cool water is much better for small burns. If the burn victim requires medical treatment, that treatment will be delayed and complicated if substances have been spread on the burned skin. Burns damage or destroy the body's protective covering. Applying ice directly to skin that has been damaged by heat, chemicals, or fire can cause additional damage to skin tissue and nerve endings. Remember, if clothing is on fire, stop, drop, and roll on the floor or ground. If necessary, douse the fire with water. Remove burning or smoldering clothing that is not stuck to the victim's skin. If the area is smoky, remove the victim from the area. Check the victim's pulse and breathing. If they have no pulse or respirations, call for help and start CPR. If pulse and breathing are present, consider cooling the burned skin, but only where the burn involves less than 20% of the total skin surface for adults or less than 5% of total skin surface for a child. If flames or hot vapors have been inhaled, you'll need to help maintain an open airway for the victim. If the victim has suffered a chemical burn, not a fire, you should immediately decontaminate the skin by flushing it with large amounts of water. And you should never apply ice or ointments, grease, margarine, butter, or similar materials on burned skin. Now, just as the body's protective covering can be damaged or destroyed by heat or fire, it can also be damaged or destroyed by extreme cold. Frostbite occurs when a person is exposed to cold without adequate protection. It results from tiny ice particles forming in the skin and other tissues. Usually, those areas of the body which are most exposed are vulnerable to frostbite. Fingertips, ears, nose, and lower extremities, especially the feet and the toes. Usually, frostbite occurs painlessly. The first signs that it may be occurring are a dull ache and a loss of flexibility in the fingers and toes. 
In more advanced stages, the skin color may change, and frostbitten skin may feel hard and waxy. When frostbite is in the advanced stages, there is no pain. If any of the signs or symptoms of frostbite are apparent, the victim must be taken to a hospital emergency department without delay. If time is available before transporting the victim, you may rewarm the frostbitten areas in water. The water must be between 100 and 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Use a thermometer to control the water temperature. Higher temperatures can cause serious injury to frostbitten tissues. As the frostbitten tissue is rewarmed, it should turn pink and it may become painful. This is a normal response. You will need to protect the frostbitten areas by padding them until the victim can be delivered to a hospital emergency department. If blisters appear in frostbitten areas, protect them against breaking. There are several things you must not do if you are providing first aid to a frostbite victim. You must not rub the frostbitten area, especially with snow or ice. This causes further injury. You must not give the victim alcoholic beverages or allow the victim to smoke. Nicotine reduces the amount of blood flowing to the skin. You must not attempt to rewarm the frostbitten areas when the victim's body temperature is less than normal. And finally, you should never hold a frostbitten hand or foot over a fire or heater. Any one of these common household items has the ability to poison a curious child. Whether it's a child or an adult, whether it is poison or a drug overdose, proper first aid will depend on whether the victim is conscious or unconscious. If the victim is unconscious, your first action is to check their pulse and breathing. If they have no pulse or breathing, call for help and start CPR. If the unconscious person's pulse and breathing seem adequate, call 911 or the appropriate emergency number for your area and help maintain the victim's airway while waiting for EMS personnel to arrive. Save the medicines or poison, if safe to do so, for the EMS personnel. If you encounter a person who has swallowed an unknown substance, find out what they swallowed. Even if you can't find out what they swallowed, call the nearest poison control center. If you don't know the phone number, again, call 911 or the appropriate emergency phone number for your area. Once you are placed in contact with the poison control center, be prepared to carry out the following emergency actions if you are instructed to do so. If the victim's eyes have been exposed to a potentially harmful substance, immediately flush them with clean water for at least 15 continuous minutes. If it appears that the victim has been overcome by fumes or exposed to a poisonous gas, immediately move the victim to fresh air. If you are unable to move them, open surrounding windows and doors. If at all possible, do not breathe until you have removed yourself and the victim from the fumes or vapors. If the victim has been exposed to something that will burn the skin or penetrate it, such as a caustic substance or acid or insecticide, immediately decontaminate the skin by flushing it with large amounts of water. Continue to flush the skin until official rescuers arrive at the scene. If the victim has swallowed a poisonous substance, or if you suspect it, call the poison control center immediately. And if instructed to do so, give the victim a glass of milk or water but never try to feed liquids to a person who is unconscious. If a poisoning victim feels they need to vomit, have them do so in a bowl or a wastebasket or some other portable container. In all cases where a poison victim does vomit, you must save the material that comes up and take it to the hospital with the patient. This allows medical personnel to determine the substance which was swallowed and to estimate the quantity. This may be an unpleasant task, but it could save a life. Also, if you can, take the container, the bottle or package the poisonous material came in with the victim to the hospital. That may provide additional information which would be useful to medical personnel. Strokes occur when a portion of the brain is deprived of blood or oxygen, causing a segment of the brain to die. Since the brain controls all body functions, a stroke can be a serious emergency. The signs of a stroke may include one or more of the following. The victim may have difficulty speaking or may be unable to speak. The victim may suddenly become paralyzed, usually on one side of the body. There may be a sudden loss of memory or worsening of memory, or the victim may become disoriented. A headache can sometimes indicate that a stroke has occurred. Another sign might be visual disturbances, such as blurred or double vision, which comes on suddenly or over a short period of time. 
And finally, if the victim has not been a victim of seizures in the past, the occurrence of a seizure could indicate that the victim has suffered a stroke. If it appears the victim has suffered a stroke, you should first call 911, or the appropriate emergency number for your area, and report the signs and symptoms to the emergency medical dispatcher. While waiting for official rescuers to arrive, you can help mainly by showing concern and making the victim comfortable. As in all medical emergencies, you need to be concerned about the victim's airway. With a stroke victim, you can do this by placing the victim on his left side. Some stroke victims have trouble swallowing and may choke on their own saliva. If necessary, extend the victim's neck and clear the mouth of saliva periodically. Meantime, keep the victim warm. Many strokes are caused by untreated high blood pressure. The most effective method for preventing strokes is to have your blood pressure checked routinely and to take blood pressure medication regularly if it has been prescribed for you. Another medical emergency that occurs often without warning is seizure, sometimes referred to as convulsions or fits. Seizures cause their victims to have uncontrollable body movements, most often while the victim is unconscious. While they sometimes seem to last forever, seizures really only last 35 to 45 seconds most of the time. As a rule, seizures in small children are caused either by high body temperature or by a condition known as epilepsy. Seizures caused by high body temperatures occur mostly in children under the age of five. Seizures in adults often are related to serious medical problems or injuries. The victim's head should be kept from striking anything hard. In all cases where the victim suffers a seizure and has a high body temperature, feels feverish, whether the victim is a child or an adult, these are the first aid steps that you should follow. Call 911 and describe the victim's signs and symptoms to the emergency medical dispatcher. If the seizure has stopped, be sure to tell the dispatcher. If the victim is unconscious, make sure he can breathe. As in all emergencies, protect the victim's airway. You should not bathe an unconscious victim and should never apply rubbing alcohol or ice to the victim of a seizure. If the victim begins to shiver while you are cooling the body, discontinue the cooling. The other most common cause of a seizure is a condition known as epilepsy. Epileptic seizures may be either major, known as grand mal, or they may be minor, known as petit mal. The signs and the symptoms can range from minor twitching or a few seconds of a blank stare to major convulsions of the unconscious victim's entire body. In all cases of epileptic seizure, whether the victim is a child or an adult, these are the first aid steps you should follow. Call 911 and describe the victim's signs and symptoms to the emergency medical dispatcher. The victim of a major seizure should be seen by a physician at an emergency clinic or hospital shortly after the seizure. Your most important role is to protect the victim from further harm while the seizure is underway, but you should not try to resist the convulsive body movements. Also, you shouldn't put anything in the victim's mouth during a convulsion. As with all medical emergencies, it's important for you to do what you can to protect the victim's airway. Finally, it's important for you to stay on the phone with the emergency medical dispatcher until the seizure stops and breathing is assured. Extremes of cold and heat remind us just how fragile the human body is. When the air temperature climbs 25 to 30 degrees above normal, for example, many people suffer from one or more forms of heat illness. These illnesses are compounded by high humidity. The three most common types of heat illness are heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. Heat cramps should be considered the least serious and heat stroke the most serious. The human body uses body fluids in the form of perspiration to regulate body temperature. Perspiration on the skin allows the body to cool. But if the body has lost much of its fluid content, it may not be able to produce sufficient perspiration to regulate body temperature. That's usually when heat illnesses strike. Heat cramps usually occur during strenuous physical activity in high temperatures. For example, a youngster who plays hard on a hot summer afternoon. The signs and symptoms of heat cramps are stomach cramps, severe pain in arms and legs, and pale, damp skin. To care for a victim of heat cramps, you need to get them into a cool place and lay them down face up. If the victim is fully conscious, give them a mild salt water solution to drink. But never try to feed liquids to a person who is unconscious. 
Also, you should call the 911 number or the appropriate emergency number for your area and describe the victim's symptoms to the emergency medical dispatcher. The dispatcher should be trained to decide whether emergency medical personnel are going to be needed. Heat exhaustion is more severe than heat cramps, and it results from a severe loss of body fluids. This can occur as a result of heavy perspiration, vomiting, diarrhea, or heavy alcohol consumption. The signs and symptoms of heat exhaustion are rapid pulse, a high body temperature between 102 and 104 degrees Fahrenheit, cool, damp skin, nausea, headache, and dizziness, difficulty with vision and confusion, irritable mood or behavior, and mild cramps. To care for a victim of heat exhaustion, get them to lie down face up in a cool or shady place. Loosen their clothing. If the victim is fully conscious, give them a mild salt water solution, about one teaspoon of salt to a quart of water to drink. But again, never try to feed liquids to a person who is unconscious. Call 911 or the appropriate emergency number for your area and describe the victim's symptoms to the emergency dispatcher. Heat stroke is the most serious of the heat illnesses. It is a serious emergency requiring proper first aid and prompt emergency care by medical personnel. Heat stroke is an overwhelming breakdown in the body's system for regulating body temperature. It affects elderly people most often and usually occurs after strenuous activity or long-term exposure to hot, humid conditions. The signs and symptoms of heat stroke include a body temperature over 104 degrees Fahrenheit, a very rapid pulse and breathing, hot, dry skin and flushed appearance, nausea, weakness and dizziness, convulsions, confusion or coma. To provide first aid to the victim of heat stroke, you should first call 911 and inform the emergency medical dispatcher of the victim's signs and symptoms. The dispatcher should recognize this as heat stroke and send EMS personnel immediately. Now while waiting for EMS personnel to arrive, you should remove the victim's clothing, cover the victim with a wet sheet. If available, turn on a fan or air conditioner to help cool off the victim. In trying to cool victims of heat illnesses, you should not use rubbing alcohol on their skin. Although it evaporates rapidly, it may be absorbed into the skin and aggravate the victim's medical condition. Nosebleeds are usually more of a nuisance than an emergency. The vast majority of nosebleeds are not life-threatening. Usually they're caused by trauma, such as being struck on the nose. Sometimes they result from drying of the inside of the nose due to high altitude or low humidity. Head colds with vigorous nose blowing sometimes cause nosebleeds, not to mention plain old nose picking. Occasionally, however, a bleed can result from high blood pressure or bleeding inside the head. To provide first aid for nosebleed, you should have the victim sit up and forward, head tipped downward, to prevent swallowing of blood. Calm the victim, have them pinch the entire nose for at least 10 minutes. Keep track of the time and don't let go to check for bleeding during this time. Holding a cool, damp washcloth across the nose may cause the blood vessels in the nose to constrict and stop bleeding sooner. Do not apply ice cubes directly to the skin, as the ice might cause frostbite. If the nosebleed cannot be controlled with pressure, pinching the nose for 10 minutes or more, transport the victim to an emergency clinic or hospital. Unless it appears that the victim is suffering from shock or a head injury, this is not a life-threatening emergency. Rapid transportation is not normally required. Remember that if a nosebleed is severe enough and continues long enough to result in major blood loss, it can cause shock, which is a very serious condition. If the nosebleed victim seems to be suffering from shock, call 911 and report the situation to an emergency medical dispatcher. The dispatcher should be trained to help decide whether emergency medical services will be needed. If the victim is known to have a blood disorder, high blood pressure or tumors in the nose, a nosebleed should be considered a possible emergency. Normally, nosebleeds can be cared for as we have described in the first aid tape. If they occur frequently, however, the victim should be given a thorough physical examination by a physician. Our wonderful sense of sight is something that we tend to take for granted until it is threatened. Few things can be more distressing than a foreign object lodged in an eye. Objects in the eye usually cause some degree of panic, especially in children. 
First aid must be given immediately and calmly to prevent any further damage to the eye. There are three common injuries to the eye resulting from foreign object or substances. First, there are the objects which lodge between the eye and the eyelid. More serious are those cases where objects penetrate the eye itself. Also, there are situations where chemicals or corrosive materials come in contact with the eye. To provide first aid when an object is lodged between the eye and the eyelid, it may be possible to flush it from the eye using clean water. In flushing the affected eye, pour water from the nose toward the outer corner of the eye. If this doesn't work, if the object remains in the eye, or if there is continuing pain, or if there is any bleeding, place a gauze bandage over both eyes, instruct the patient not to move the eyes, and arrange for transportation of the victim to an emergency clinic or hospital. Now, if you find that an object is penetrating the victim's eye, do not attempt to remove the object. This is a medical procedure, which must be performed by medical personnel at a hospital emergency department. The first thing you should do is call 911, or the appropriate emergency number for your area. While waiting for EMS personnel to arrive, place a gauze bandage over both eyes without applying any pressure to the penetrating object. Both eyes move together and both must be covered to prevent movement of the injured eye. If fluid is leaking from the eyeball, do not apply pressure and do not put any water into the eye. One way of protecting the eye is to cover the eye and the penetrating object with a paper cup, as demonstrated here. When you are faced with a victim whose eyes have been in contact with chemicals or corrosives, time is of the essence. Have someone call 911 or the appropriate emergency number for your area and immediately begin flushing the eyes with clean water. Do not use any other substance in the water or in place of water. Continue flushing until EMS personnel arrive. Most often, but not always, objects in the ear are children's emergencies. For example, a child may complain that he cannot hear in one ear or the other, but he won't admit or can't remember placing anything in the ear. In other cases, the child may admit to putting something in the ear, such as a small bead or a bean. Sometimes, the first indication a parent will have may be an unusual discharge from the ear or the child's complaint of an earache. Occasionally, while the victim is sleeping, an insect may find the ear canal to be an inviting, warm, moist resting place. The sound and feel of a bug crawling in the ear is frightening for a child or an adult. In every case where there is an object in the ear, the victim should be taken to an emergency clinic or hospital for removal of the object and examination by a physician. Normally, this will not be an emergency requiring ambulance transportation. If the victim does have a live bug in the ear, and if it is causing pain or anxiety, you can promptly kill the insect by filling the ear canal with mineral oil. This procedure will not harm the victim. It's the same thing an emergency physician would do before trying to remove the insect from the ear canal. There are several things you should not do when dealing with an object in the ear. You should not use a rigid instrument or device such as tweezers to remove an object from a victim's ear. The ear is very delicate and can be easily damaged. The object could be forced farther down into the ear canal. Removal of the object should be performed by an emergency physician. Do not try to remove a bug from the ear without killing it with mineral oil first, even if you can see the bug. If the insect realizes its life is being threatened, it might sting or bite the inside of the ear canal. And finally, do not try to flush a bean or a seed from the ear. The water could cause the bean or the seed to swell inside the ear canal, making it more difficult to retrieve. In many areas of the country, ticks are a common insect. They are usually found after they've attached themselves to the skin of pets or humans. Once a tick attaches its head to the skin of its unwilling host, it engorges its body with blood. It's unsightly, it's disgusting to most victims, and many people are concerned about the possibility they might contract some form of tick fever. First aid in this case should be limited to removing the tick. You can do that by grasping the insect in the area of its head and legs with a pair of tweezers or small forceps. Slowly pull upward until the tick's head is separated from your skin. A small piece of skin may come off with the tick's pinchers. If the tick's head or portions of the head break off and remain attached to the skin as you're trying to remove the tick, use a paring knife blade perpendicular to the skin and scrape sideways. 
do not cut the victim's skin. If a portion of the tick remains attached, it may be necessary to visit a physician at an emergency clinic or hospital for surgical removal. Whether or not you see a physician with this problem, you should record the victim's temperature twice a day for the next two weeks to watch for signs of infection or flu symptoms. If temperature rises above normal, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit during this time, the victim should be seen by a physician. Now this is not normally an emergency condition. The likelihood of the victim contracting some form of tick fever is less than 1%. If it does occur, an otherwise healthy person can be cured with prompt treatment. One final note about ticks. Don't waste your time trying to remove a tick with lighted matches, Vaseline, or other techniques that supposedly will make the tick back out or drop off. They simply don't work, and they increase the possibility of infection. Drowning is one of the major causes of accidental death in the United States. Usually it occurs in unsupervised water areas, but it can also occur in the home, in bathtubs, swimming pools, and sometimes even in very shallow water. Drowning and near drowning is greatly misunderstood. Many people believe that drowning occurs when water enters the lungs. Actually, most drownings occur when the swimmer panics or gets tired and starts to inhale water. When that happens, the larynx reacts by sealing off the airway from the water that's trying to enter it. And this keeps out the water, but the victim also is without oxygen. After a short period of time without oxygen, the victim becomes unconscious. Eventually, the victim's heart, trying to function without oxygen, lapses into cardiac arrest. Only in rare situations will a significant amount of water enter a drowning victim's lungs. Usually, it occurs after they have been unconscious, underwater, for some time and the larynx relaxes. In those cases, there are medical differences between the effect that fresh water versus salt water has on the lungs and body. However, for first aid, all drowning victims must be treated the same way and promptly. Because drowning occurs in stages, first the larynx closes to prevent water from entering the lungs, then the lack of oxygen causes the victim to be unconscious, then the lack of oxygen causes the heart to lapse into cardiac arrest, your rescue effort may depend on how long the victim has been without oxygen. In discussing first aid for drownings, however, we need to use the proper techniques for helping a swimmer in trouble. Most water safety experts suggest that you go into the water after a swimmer only as a last resort. In fact, there is a saying that you should throw, tow, row, and only then go. What that means is that you should throw a buoy or a similar device to the swimmer if they seem to be in trouble. And if they can reach the buoy, then you should tow them in. If they're in a lake or another large body of water, and if a boat is available immediately, you should row out to the swimmer. If those efforts don't work or are not possible, then you should go into the water to assist the swimmer. If the victim is unconscious when you find or retrieve him, make sure official rescuers have been called and then start artificial respiration if that's necessary. First, clear the airway. Make sure the victim is not breathing. If there is no breathing, you should force two breaths into the victim's mouth. Because a spasm may have closed the victim's airway, it may be necessary to blow hard. Even though it's not likely that a lot of water will get into the lungs of a drowning victim, it's probable that a large quantity will get into the stomach. Also, it is likely the stomach contents will come up during the rescue effort. You must make sure the vomitous material does not collect in the mouth as that could block the airway or get into the airway and the lungs. If your rescue effort occurs quickly enough, you may be able to revive the victim with rescue breathing alone. That could happen if the heart has not arrested by the time you clear the airway and begin artificial ventilation. However, if you check and find the victim has no pulse, you will need to get him onto a firm surface and start CPR immediately. You must continue CPR until you are relieved by an official rescuer. If you ever have the opportunity to provide first aid to a drowning victim, you should never be discouraged by cold skin, a lifeless appearance, or bluish color. Sometimes the effect of cold water actually improves the possibility of survival for persons who have been submerged for long periods. It's called the mammalian diving reflex, and it causes all body function to slow down so that there is far less need for oxygen. There are recorded cases of complete recovery by persons who have been submerged in cold water for 20 minutes or more. Never give up on a drowning victim before the victim can be evaluated by a physician. 
In cases where back or spinal injury is suspected, for example, where the victim became unconscious after striking his head while diving, you're going to need to provide first aid while immobilizing the neck and protecting the airway. This type of injury is one of the most common causes of paralysis among young persons, and it is essential that you suspect it. First aid and water safety programs, such as those conducted by the American Red Cross, will provide you with more complete information about caring for the drowning victim. Well, that's it. At the beginning of this video, when we said that this may be the most important tape that you'll ever watch, we meant it. So please don't let this be the last time you view it or read through the quick reference cards. Take the time to learn the life-saving techniques that we discussed on this videotape. And with that knowledge, you might just save a life. Thank you.